in aerodynamics, we have so far looked at very interesting concepts of what is this origin of aerodynamics, hydrodynamics. We have looked at the basic derivations of pitot tube, incompressible flows, the derivations of continuity momentum equations and then we dealt into applying them to solve a set of basic flow problems, right? The potential flow as we defined as a theory in which we looked at vortex, we looked at infinitely uniform streamlined flows, we looked at doublets and we derived flow around solid objects like cylinder or aerofoil by actually using the potential flow application. Now the next logical step of course is to extend this analogy into aircraft because after all the entire objective is to look at how the flow behaves around the aircraft wing. But before we go there, we have to build some other fundamental concept tools. Because in aerofoil analysis, we will need few of the following components. So imagine this is an aerofoil on which you are doing the analysis of the flow, right? The first important thing that you would need as a building block is potential flow. Theory, right? ADs, AJS, vortex, so on. Second, you need viscous effects. Because no matter how greatly you analyze potential flow solutions as a combination and superposition of set of basic flows, viscosity is going to play a role. In, in viscid fluid is imaginary stream. You are going to need boundary layer because we see that aerofoil at this surface here right when the flow is getting developed or even here velocity at the wall is zero no slip this is a no brainer it's a physics which means boundary layer will get developed and will change the dynamics of lifting of this significantly from this or even this plus this so you need this third building block and fourth block is gas dynamics wherein the temperature, Cp, heat and Mach number are going to play a role. If M is equal to 0.8, typically the range at which aircrafts fly, locally there may be a shock. You have seen this, right? You will need this foundation to analyze the thermal behavioral properties of the gas around it, which has also implication, by the way, on Cl, Cd, even Cl alpha, the lift coefficient ratios in, in your aircraft stability analysis in flight mechanics. All of this, therefore, needs not only the potential flow theory, but three other basic building blocks of aerodynamic theory. Once you are familiar with this, then you are in a position to go to a lifting theory or a finite, infinite wing or a lifting element theory based on which you can analyze aerofoil and then later extend it to finite wing or a three-dimensional wing. Have you got the complete thought process of how we are building aerodynamic chapters? This so far is over. Now this chapter, we are going to look at viscous effects or simply the analysis of viscous flows, right? So in order to do this, we have to start always with basic two-dimensional flows. The reason being, two-dimensional flows are most attractive and important to evaluate when you look at aerofoil. Your aerofoil is nothing but two-dimensional flows, right? So two-dimensional flows give you extremely nice picture of what is happening in two-dimensional problems and then you can very easily extend it to all the three dimensions, right? So that's the whole reason by which you will be looking at two-dimensional flows. Now, in two-dimensional flows, we have general 2D flow analysis. See how we are going to build this entire story. You have count flow. This is nothing but plates. 
a closed enclosed flow between some plates right then poison is flow somewhere in 12th standard physics you may have prepared for some exams and you might have encountered this term capillary flows most of the times are called poiseuille's flows right the capillary action that you would see of the fluid lifting up is mostly governed by poiseuille's flows so very important flow to analyze right then you have polar poiseuille which is nothing but r theta coordinate cylinder the reason is this theory is very easily applicable to cylindrical surfaces like capillary and also has important applications in aerodynamics then we have rotating cylinder flow why many of real life applications can be modeled using this analogy where is nothing is rotating practically but in the frame of reference you could derive solid objects and define a problem in such a way that this can become as a rotating cylindrical flow and last is other typical laminar flows right since this is a short chapter we will not break this into theory and tutorial part later the single chapter flow i would request you to complete pay attention from start to end and absorb everything and keep rewinding this so that once at the short viscous theory is done so we will look at these first from physics and then mathematical analysis point of view and in between only we will solve two three simple problems to reinforce the concepts so that we don't have to do a separate tutorial it is not required for such a small chapter so this chapter you will not find any tutorial specifically but it is embedded in this theory lecture itself so let's begin with this let the journey begin right that's what people say so now i am at a point where i am going to analyze general two dimensional flow right what do i do in two dimensional flow first of all i have to look at continuity equation continuity equation standard coordinates del rho by del t plus u del of rho u by del x plus v del of rho v by del y plus w same way right this is the continuity equation important assumption in most of it is steady state flow in your aerofoil also by the way most of the undergraduate aerodynamic syllabus looks 99% at this case what happens in steady state equilibrium because the transient phenomena may be greatly important to a final aerodynamics designer a super fine designer who is now at a stage where everything is frozen the preliminary analysis starts with this because this governs the basic shape body aerofoil selection the flows mach numbers reynolds numbers and everything and 99% it is up to the mark transient behaviors may be important to analyze overall stability and flight envelopes but in a given imposement condition this is more than enough i am repeating this sentence transients may be important to define and refine the flight envelope further and granularly tell you the performance but they are not necessary conditions to drive the design fundamentally from scratch this is what you need always remember so this is a steady state flow second it's a two dimensional flow right so in two dimensional flow we are going to have third axis absent or infinite simply okay now with these assumptions in our continuity equation we can always eliminate this okay another thing is because third axis is absent i can always eliminate z axis and conveniently make it a planar flow with x and y axis right okay? i can always do that now third assumption c is incompressible flows which can always be relaxed it's not very substantial the whole reason to do it is i can get u del u by del x plus v del v by del y equal to 0 better to live with that's all nothing gets okay 
So that's the assumption. Now let us look at momentum equation. Momentum equation will tell me that I have del u by del t plus u del u by del x plus v del u by del y plus w del u by del z right is equal to 1 upon rho del t by del x or dt by dx because it's a scalar gradient right most of the times it may be written if p is a function of x y z so i can write this way plus mu upon rho the fluid property right the viscosity property finally del square u right del square u by del x square plus del square w by del y square plus del square w by del z square this is one axis dimension right again because of the first two assumptions all del u by del t time transient terms go w is zero so del z is gone and this is simply del square u by del x square plus del square v by del y square del square u by del y square right this is one equation right so we will call this as 2a and 2b is simply v del v by del x plus v del v by del y plus w now w term is 0 so again you will get two dimension as u del v by del x plus v del v by del y is equal to 1 upon rho del p by del y plus mu upon rho same thing right? these are the two dimensional momentum equations energy we don't need so far right that's the third chapter so see how viscosity is now coming now we are no longer ignoring these terms in potential flow but we are actually looking at these viscous terms right? So this is the general analysis of Cartesian flows in two dimension. It's a Cartesian frame of reference, steady state, incompressible for now, right? Steady state, incompressible for now, and two dimensions, third axis is gone. Similar in polar coordinates, how would you look at it? Del rho by del t term is anyway zero. One upon r, del of r u r by del r right plus 1 upon r del by del theta u theta is equal to 0 z term gone because it's a two dimensional flow right or if the flow is axisymmetric I have eliminated rho by compressibility assumptions, right? Why all the three terms? Because in polar coordinates, for example, if it's a cylinder and I say axisymmetric flow u theta equal to zero, still it becomes two dimensional flow in r and z coordinate. Always remember, your r thetas are here, right? But there is third axis z. Now the flow may be two dimensional in this plane or maybe two dimensional in this plane right so a cylinder which is a typical example of axisymmetry you would require z and r or z and theta but not r so still it is two dimensional flow so i will keep this depending on the condition it still is valid two dimensional flow so in polar coordinates now the momentum equation will be transient terms gone u dot del of u r minus u theta square upon r centrifugal term is 1 upon rho del p by del r plus mu upon rho del square u r minus u r upon r square minus 2 upon r square del u theta by del theta. Okay. This is one set of equation and similarly you can write other set of equations for u theta. Here you will get u r u theta by r and u dot del of u theta, right? Transient terms, u r u theta and u z is of course u dot del of u z. Because depending on r theta z symmetry, only two of these three are going to be used. 
is simply minus 1 upon rho del p by del z plus mu upon rho del square uz. So in polar coordinates if you see u del theta, this is a very simple equation, right? In polar coordinates, you are going to have this equation plus this equation if theta is axisymmetric or this plus this if z is absent, two dimension or theta and z if r tangential flows are absent, right? Swirl flows. And that's exactly the case which is point number 5 and 6, right? That we will look at. So once this theoretical framework is done, we have looked at general 2D flow. We will now look at flow in between infinite parallel planes. So scenario is, you have to look at these two infinite planes. These are bounded flows, right? By actual solid geometry. Internal flows also it is called. But this analysis is important before we extend this analogy to external flows, which is error So here the flow is flowing. And you have between 0 and h, two infinite plates. So thickness in z-axis is infinity. Which means these are infinite plates in this room. The wall and the floor extended till infinity. Because of which z is absent. Two dimensions. This x is also tending to infinity. Why? So that is entry effects or exit effects at the edge. right? Where the flow is going to enter, exit, develop is gone. Which means fully developed flow. All transitions, whatever we are supposed to happen, are done. Since this axis is very, very large. That is the whole reason. So it is quasi-1D flow also, majority of the time is called. Because 0 to h, y is what governs the behavior of the flow properties. Right? So having looked at this, therefore, let us carefully look at how you will solve. We don't need a polar coordinates here. Given x and z are almost infinity and one axis dominating, we need simple Cartesian equations. So in the Cartesian equations, del by del t is 0, del by del z is 0, two dimensional flow. Del by del x is equal to 0. And this is very important reason. Had there been any gradient, any mathematical function subjected to infinity lengths would always diverge. See the reasoning I am giving. These plates, if they had any variation between x, I could have always shifted my frame of reference. Right? So say u was 10 and because of gradient u is 15 here downstream. I could always shift my frame of reference here and now start getting a problem further downwards. Mathematically inconsistent because in infinite analogy this would diverge in that case depending on the frame or it could go to minus infinity which means in infinite play there is no possibility of gradient to play along infinite axis so del by del x is 0 so the whole equation from continuity I am left with is as simple as v del v by del y equal to 0 right rest all the terms are gone now this has two parts if v is a function of y because we have seen v cannot be a function of x or z because of this analogy of no ingredients in infinite dimensions then del v by del y is f dash of y so f of y into f dash of y is equal to 0 right when would this happen either f of y is 0 or see this is pure mathematical reasoning f dash of y is 0 this is possible when f of y is 0 or f of y is constant which means f of y equal to 0 is always a global solution. You can find it in irrespective of the case. But if f of y is equal to constant, right? that is v is constant across, then the momentum crossing this hypothetical wall, right? this is v, is non-zero. 
which means there is a cross flow flow c because v is not equal to 0 right but in these plates these are bounding if you flow water in the room it cannot hit the floor or the top and actually get out of the roof it cannot hit the floor and dig a hole on its own it will flow between these two physical boundaries right the fluid which is bounded by physical solid objects has to flow between those two solid objects it cannot flow like this so at a wall y equal to 0 and y is equal to h v this directional flow perpendicular to the wall has to be 0 but that is only possible if this constant goes to 0 which means the only solution which satisfies this equation is v is equal to 0 in all other case you will get inconsistent boundary because f of y equal to constant would mean you cannot have a variation of v f dash of y is 0 no so if v is locally 0 here but constant in between there is a sharp gradient not allowed which means continuity equation tells you that in this case vertical velocity in y direction is absent so only velocity you would have is u so now therefore what would happen to our momentum equations? V is gone, right? Because if V is 0, all V related terms are gone. Now, del square u by del x square, right? That's what it is important. This is 0. Is that right? This is also 0 because del u by del x it has to be 0 this gradient function which means simply the first equation becomes as simple as this depending on the pressure gradient which pushes or pulls the flow between these plates, you will form a certain function of y. Right? That's what it is showing. Second equation, y momentum. Del v is 0, v is 0. So this entire left hand side has to be 0. Here, again, this is all 0. Now rho is non-zero. Right? Since the energy because of V component going to 0, everything vanished except the pressure. But del P y is 0 means P is not function of Y. Because had the P pressure been function of Y, you couldn't have got gradient 0, which means P of Y is equal to constant or 0. So, pressure is purely a function of X. Right? We have eliminated xy function and simplified it as purely a function of x to satisfy second continuity equation, momentum equation. That means del p by del x is actually dp by dx, scalar gradient. It is not two, two dimensional function anymore, right? So del is replaced by d, simple. Now, if I take this to right hand side, right? What I am left with? Rho will be gone. See how incompressibility is playing. Because rho is constant, rho got eliminated. So all I am left with, so I have used all the equations now, right? I have used the continuity, I have used second momentum. Only equation which I have not used is first momentum equation. And the first momentum equation is going to give me variation of u. Now t is function of x. So on RHS there is no, so this is of the form g of y right into g double dash of y equal to f of x I can easily integrate this without any problem now if I integrate it one time right what will I be left with dp by dx into y right plus c1 first integral of constant and this is 1 upon mu is anyway there, right? So 1 upon mu will always be present. Plus C1. 
right, is equal to del u by del y, second integral dy. So I will be 1 upon mu dp by dx y square upon 2 plus c1y plus c2. This is going to satisfy this equation because on second derivation this is going to give me this value. So I know the form of u, right? A u function is governed by dp by dx, the pressure gradient which drives the flow and is a parabolic function y, right? C1 and C2 will be found based on some specific condition imposed on these plates. But as a theory, the first point of flow between infinite two-dimensional plates stops here. Because you have got the function for u which depends on these and these are governed by boundary conditions. Which are those other specific, Poita, Poisley, these are all those specific derivations of this generic equation. What will be the volume flow rate? It is u dy 0 to h, right? That is the total flow crossing this fluid boundary. And this is simply, you can integrate it here. And what will be the mass flow rate? Rho into q, which is rho u dy. So as soon as you freeze a boundary condition, you get a frozen value function for u which gives you volume flow and mass flow rate. What will be tau? It is simply mu del u by del y plus del v by del x, right? Two dimensional stress analysis we have done, shear stress. But since del v by del x is zero, v is zero, tau is simply mu del u by del y. So moment you know u, you know mass flow rate, you know shears. That's the property of viscosity. The viscous fluid has to exert shear force and has to have a mass flow rate which is different from a constant mass flow rate. Had everything been non-viscous flow with uniform fluid, it would have been simply U into H. Right? So in inviscid potential flow, this was rho U H. Right? But here it is different because u itself has become function of y because of viscosity effect. So what is happening in physics? From physics point, the potential flow had no discrimination between the axes chosen. Because when the flow was flowing, information as to what is happening downstream or upstream of my drop. So I am I'm one sheet of droplets. I am moving forward and backward in the pressure. What was happening to guy below me? and above me was useless for me. It was incompressible, irrotational, inviscid flow. Viscosity is a communication bridge. This sheet moving with respect to other sheet starts sending information. Hey, I am at the wall, I am at stationary. Why do you guys want to flow? The middle sheet is in very much enthusiasm. Right? So let's look at fluid sheets. Right? And this is very important mathematical analogy I am explaining you from the physics. Okay? So let us look at this more deeply into physics before we jump into the next flows. These are the two physical solid walls. Imagine you are a small guy sitting on this fluid sheet F1. I am a second small guy sitting on this fluid sheet F2. And friend of yours is sitting on this guy on fluid sheet F3. They are all being dragged by this motor which generates a suction. They are being forced to come out of this pipe. That's how it is realistic physics. I am here. I am super enthusiastic. Let's go. Somebody is calling us. Let's go. So I started my journey. In inviscid, irrotational, incompressible, I did not pay any attention to your screams, whatever you are saying, no go, no go, I said forget it. Because viscosity, the communication bridge was absent. This another guy was also observing and saying, why is he going? Fine, let him go. In viscosity, it is no longer case. We have got mobile phones to communicate. You tell me, hey, I am sitting at the wall very beautifully. Where are you going? I said, what? There is this 
big suction pump which is calling me. I have to go. I am running at 10 meter per second. He says, are you mad? I am at zero velocity here. I am st standing on the wall. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't feel any pressure also. I don't see any pump. Now the guy in between, another friend of yours, is thoroughly confused because of these mobiles he is receiving. I am saying 10 meter per second bhago. You are saying why run? He says, guys, I am confused. Let me listen to both. Let me adjust my speed such that I am also happy that he is running and you are also happy that he is not running. Typical teacher student, some in between caught guy will always half heartedly listen to teacher. He wants to satisfy teacher also and his friend also. He is not at all interested in studies. See, I am not studying. And to teacher, see, I am studying. This is that gradation of the velocity because of this guy, mu, the viscosity guy, who communicates this information about this pressure between the sheets of the flow. Potential flow never thought of this. But realistically, a flow always adjusts its course and journey based on these signals. It is that friction to adjust. And that's why potential flow gave you rho u h as the total flow rate. All of us were pushed and whacked. Now I am pushed hard, you are pushed zero. In between guys adjust their speed so that this gradient is managed. That's viscosity. I think you will remember this analogy throughout your life now. Why and how this propagation signal is important and why do you get such a quadratic form. So this is the fundamental theory now of two-dimensional flow analysis. Now we will go to the second part where certain people came up to a solution of this by certain boundary conditions being used. So now, in cottage flow, out flow, right? What did he say? Same plate say look, right? The analysis for which the theoretical framework we derived of height h. And he said, this, there is no pressure gradient. So he said, there is no pressure. But now the wall at the top starts moving itself. Right? So this is the flying Aladdin's magic magic barrage and so this wall itself moves. It moves with velocity v forward. This is stationary. Right? So it's frozen, fixed. What do you expect would happen? In in this case, flow here would move. But information is constantly getting exchanged now because of viscosity. So you would expect the sheets nearby here to be stationary and sheets nearby here to match this running because their entire frame of reference, the follower they were following is itself running. But when they turn their eye from left to right, right, they would see these guys are more stationary, so they will adjust. So you would form a gradient of velocity, something like this. Now will it be linear or quadratic? We have to see because this gradient is also possible. This gradient is also possible. All the three shapes are possible. Concave, convex, linear. Mathematics, right? We have just said there is zero to x variation. It may vary in any of these shapes. Now what I said, okay. Define these boundary conditions. Let us start solving this question. So he said, at y is equal to zero, u with zero, no velocity is possible, stationary. So C2, the constant of integration is 0, right? because nothing else will be 0. At a y is equal to h, u has to be v. Locally there cannot be any slip, we know this. We just analyzed it, right? What is the boundary condition explicitly? This wall is moving at v, this sheet nearest to it has to move at v. Viscosity effect, which means v is 1 upon mu dp by dx, right? But dp by dx is 0. So c1 is v upon h. So he found out the constants of integration. So he said velocity u is simply v upon h into y. So the answer to this variation is because no pressure gradient is present, 
it is a linear increase from zero velocity to v velocity. What will be the mass flow rate? Rho v by h y dy zero to h. We have seen this definition, which is rho v by h into h square upon two. So it is rho v h by two. And what is tau? Del u by del y into mu. We have seen this, which is mu v upon h. Extremely startling result. Had you ignored viscosity, potential flow would have given you mass flow double than this, and this is zero. But realistically. You are getting half the mass flow and much higher st shear stress, right? And these are uniformly going to be applied on this structure as well. So tau is going to be applied here, which means that tau is going to play an important role in design of the plates itself. See how viscosity has made our world upside down. In Cauchy's flow, we will solve one simple question so that at this stage you are clear about all these concepts and derivations we have been doing, right? And you can relate it in a practical way. So what we have been doing is there are two infinite plates one meter apart. So h is equal to one meter is given and moving at two meter per second. Very hmm? normal velocity. Viscosity of air is seven into ten raised to minus three newton meter per Newton second per meter square, right? Find the shear stress between the two fluid layers. We know tau. We just derived it as mu v upon h, which is seven into ten raised to minus three. Velocity is two upon one, so it is fourteen milli newton second per meter square, right? The units will be. This. This is substantial stress, by the way, for a fluid. What would happen because of this? The fluid itself is going to undergo scrubbing, rubbing, and heating. We have not used thermal equations so far, but any stress builds up energy. So, by relaxing the assumption of non-viscosity, you have got surprisingly different results of such a simple problem of flow between two plates. Now we will look at plain Poiseuille flow. Here you have y is equal to zero and y is equal to h again, two infinite plates, but now subjected to a pressure gradient. So a pump is introduced. Now there is no moving wall. There is no guy which is moving, right? What would be the case? U is one upon mu. dp by dx plus c1 y plus c2 at y is equal to 0 u is 0 which means c2 is gone and at y is equal to h u is again 0 these are the two boundary conditions here took that means correct Which means C1 is minus one upon mu dP by dx, h by two. Correct. If I substitute it here, U is one upon mu dP by dx y square upon two plus C1 y, which is minus one upon mu dP by dx. Hmm? H y by two. See how I have done. I have used both the boundary conditions to get both the constant values of velocity profile. I can take out one upon mu dP by dx and one more y out. What will I be left with? I can get two out also. H minus one. Right. So this is. the variation of parabolic variation of profile
So now because of dp by dx, you are not having linear, but you are having a parabolic variation. Such that, and it has to be symmetric. See how mathematically I am saying. It's a gradient, right? The only way to make it is like this triangle, linear. But linearity will not solve a sharp edge. So it has to be smooth parabola. So in Poiseuille's flow, a parabolic equation is derived based on the pressure gradient between the two infinite plates. And now, therefore, what will be the volume flow rate? Q. Q would be u dy 0 to h, which is 1 upon mu dp by dx will be out, integral of y square upon 2 dy minus hy by 2 dy. Right? This is y cube upon 6, right? Minus h y square upon 4 because y dy upon 2, right? So if I make y as h because at 0 it is 0, then it is h cube upon 6, right? So what will I be left with? I will be left with 2 h cube upon 24 or h cube upon 12. So the volume flow rate q is h cube upon 12 mu dp by dx. Why is negative sign creeping in? Because to make flow happen physically dp by dx is negative. Therefore, your q has this negative sign to compensate. And m dot is simply rho q, so we know that. What will be the shear stress tau? Tau is mu del u by del y, right? Which is del p by del x, because 1 upon mu and mu will get cancelled. You will be left with y, because y square upon 2, so it is y, minus h y by 2, so y minus h by 2, right? So at h by 2, So mathematically, the tau, if you see, between 0 to h, right, this is the y, at h equal to, y is equal to 0, you get negative, right, it crosses in between and becomes positive, the magnitude is dp by dx, h by 2. See how linear variation it is happening from minus, minus h by 2 to plus h by 2, right? So, shear stress reverses its sign, here to here, and I think that is very, very important. Now, what is the maximum velocity? u max, right? I have to differentiate the u. Right? Del u by del y is equal to 0. And we know it is going to happen at y is equal to h by 2. Because both the terms it is 0, so it has to pass through maximum symmetric plane. So it will be u max is equal to 1 upon mu minus dp by dx h cube upon e. Right? So we have also find out what is the maximum velocity. We have found out the relation between stress and the velocity and we have also found out the relationship between the volume flow rate for Poiseuille's flow. So these are very very important Poiseuille flow conditions, right? Very very typical. Poiseuille's next analogy was slightly more. He said, guys, I am going to introduce dp by dx as well as a moving wall. Cauté said moving wall. Poison is first a postulate said dp by dx. Now there is a pump and a moving wall. What would happen to it in a generic way? At y is equal to 0, u is 0. This is first boundary condition, right? And boundary condition 2 is at y is equal to h, u is equal to velocity of plate. If this is the case, c2 will be v1 in our u-dimensional analysis. 
So u will become 1 upon mu dp by dx y square upon 2 plus c1y plus v1. Right? That's how the two dimensional generic equation will be. So I have used this to use the boundary condition 1. Right? If I substitute it, so sorry, I'm just making this simplified. What would be the case now? Right? This is how it is. So V2 minus V1 upon H into mu. 2 mu is C1, V2 minus V1 upon H and then everything came out, right? So my C1 in this case becomes slightly complicated. V2 minus V1 upon H minus 1 upon mu dp by dx V2 square upon. Now if I substitute this here, I get u as 1 upon mu dp by dx, right? I am taking out these two constants out, right? So that I have very simplified relationship to find out. y minus 1 upon mu dp by dx v2 square upon 2y plus v1. This is the analogy, right? Now, in this analogy, we have seen that u is become more complicated function because these conditions v1 and v2 of two moving plates are non-zero and pressure gradient also playing a role. What would be the realistic profiles for this? How would therefore, based on this, the velocity maps look like between this 0 to h? When, so we are going to define some of these. One, v1 is less than zero, v2 is greater than zero. Something like this, right? So we have done a slightly generic analysis between v1, v2, dp by dx, right? That's what Poisel is in. So Poisel is plates with negative v1 and positive V2 and positive pressure gradient, the standard pressure gradient dp by dx will look like this, right? V1 equal to 0, hmm? V2 not 0, dp by dx not 0. Now, you will get something like this, right? To match V2 rather than the standard this profile, the parabola has become half, right? Because here, boundary condition no longer zero, but non-zero velocity. So this is the second case. Third case is another important case where moving wall has constant velocities which are different. So v1 equal to v2 not seen. You would get something like this. Okay. Fourth condition is dp by dx equal to 0. v1 less than 0, v2 greater than 0. Movement dp by dx is 0. You would anticipate a linear relation. If dp by dx itself is positive, you would get some relation like this. Right? 
flow is being pushed. So now you will have two optimas. And the tricky question would be, is something like this possible? Answer is no. Because now you are having three roots. Any quadratic equation cannot have more than two roots. So any profile has to have less than or equal to two roots. All these profiles, if you see, have satisfied less than or equal to two roots. One root, one root, one root, zero root, max two roots. Anything beyond this is not possible. So based on this generic theorem, Poiseuille was able to get at us a realistic profiles of all possible flow conditions. Now, once this is done, we are now going to look at Poiseuille's next more derivation, which was axisymmetric Poiseuille. So axisymmetric Poiseuille flow now goes to rather than using Cartesian frame to polar coordinate frame wherein you have this cylinder right, which is axisymmetric of R, Z most important now and this is important is this assumption why? in axisymmetric case no matter how I rotate my head with respect to theta, right? In this circle, if u itself is a function of theta, I can have my angle like this first, then like this first, then like this, and I would keep getting different values of u, which is not acceptable for a symmetric flow, because axisymmetric flow is irrespective of rotation, no matter where I rotate and stand on this one plane. So this is extremely important assumption, right? Second assumption, rho is equal to constant. Fine, incompressible. Del by del t is zero, steady state. Z tends to infinite. So del by del z is zero. So in axisymmetric flow, we are looking only at two dimensions of circle. Third dimension of the cylinder is vanished. Del by del z terms are zero. Remember we had kept all r, theta, z and z, either of the two combinations make it two dimensional flow, z is most common but not necessary. In this Poiseuille's case, it is what we are using. If this is the case, continued equation in polar coordinates which was del rho by del t plus 1 upon r del by del r rho u r r plus 1 upon r del by del theta rho u theta equal to 0 because z term anyway is gone as this term gone rho is out from everywhere so you will get r del by 1 upon r sorry del by del r of r u r u theta is 0 right del by del theta of all the terms are 0 so the second term of del by del theta has to be 0 which means the continuity equation tells me this if I integrate right? which means r u r is function of r right? which is constant so that del by del r is 0 but now the question would come that u r is 1 upon r some c upon r correct? see I have simply mathematically used my continuity equation I have said rest all terms are 0 this term survives so this has to be 0 1 upon r is not useful so del by del r of r u r is 0 which means r u r as a function is a constant function so u r is c upon r Consider a finite cylinder of radius r is equal to r. What does u r denote? Flow going out radial. Right? But this is a solid wall. At r is equal to r, a constant flow 
cannot escape the boundary. Remember our analogy, the flow between these two walls cannot dig a hole or just crack the roof. Which means this is equal to 0. That implies C is 0. Which means radial velocity ur is 0. So continuity equation implies ur is equal to 0. No radially outward flow. Only flow is a rotational flows, u theta. That's it. That's the great advantage of Poisson flow. Right? Now let us look at momentum equation. Del u by del r, del t is 0. Right? u dot del of u r minus u theta square upon r. Right? Is 1 upon rho del p by del r plus mu by rho del square u r. Right? If you now substitute it, this is what you will get, right? R momentum equation minus u square theta upon r equal to 1 upon rho del p by del r. u theta is also equal to 0, correct? Since there is no curl or swirl, that cannot be possible because otherwise theta gradient in first equation would survive. That would mean simply that dp by dr is 0. So pressure is only a function of z. Pressure cannot be a function of theta, right? Because anyway it is axisymmetric. Which means in the cylinder, the flow is going to be like this. This flow is absent. This flow is absent. So now we have to use third condition because first momentum condition gave us del square u r equal to 0 but u r was anyway 0. Second equation gave us u theta equal to 0 and dp by dr equal to 0. So we said therefore it is a pseudo one dimensional flow only in z. Now we have to use third equation in z to actually solve it. Then uz by del t, this is 0 anyway, right? Steady state. Plus u dot del of uz is minus 1 upon rho dp by dz. Now del has become d because it is only a function of z, right? Plus mu upon rho del square uz, right? This is gone, correct? Okay? Another thing is del by del theta is 0, del by del z is 0, correct? Okay? u dot del has to be 0, right? So I am left with taking to this RHS 1 upon rho dp by dz is mu upon rho and now what is del square? 1 upon r del by del r of r u z. Del by del theta and del by del z are anyway 0. Del square polar coordinate has del by del r terms, del by del theta terms and del by del z terms. 3 directional deltas, right? But these are anyway 0. So the third equation threw me a simple analogy of this equation. So, I am left with is this equation. Now, this is only f of z and this is g of r. Both are non-muting non or non-computing components. So I can integrate very easily. Now 1 upon mu because rho will get cancelled and mu will come here, right? R dr is del of r u z. So if I integrate, I will get r square upon 2 plus c1 is r u z where c1 is constant of integration. I have taken r to right hand side and then integrated with respect to dr. Now I have to derive, divide all of this thing by r. Right? Correct? Now, to further sorry, this has to be del of r. So 
So further to integrate this, I get uz as 1 upon mu dp by dz r square upon 4 plus c1 ln r plus c2. I am integrating it one more time. But uz at r is equal to 0 cannot be infinity. So this term has to be 0. ln is always a nasty beast. So c1 0 is the only condition based on which I can impose this outcome. Right? And at now second boundary condition from Poiseuille is very simple. At uz r is equal to r, this velocity is nothing but 0. This is a stationary wall. So at r is equal to r, this is like thin plate analysis, radius of circle doesn't matter. So that would mean C2 is simply minus 1 upon u dp by dz r square upon 4. So if I substitute C2, finally uz will be 1 upon mu dp by dz r square minus r square or negative sign can come out. See how symmetric analogy this is. Right? So, using the equations, I have got a very beautiful parabolic curvature. dp by dz is generally negative for push, so this will become positive velocity. If dp by dz is positive, rather than suction, a blow, uz will become negative. Right? So, things are perfect. That means, uz max is at r is equal to 0, correct? Because the variation is like this. Just like Poiseuille's and the value is minus 1 upon mu dp by dz r square upon 4. So it depends on the radius of cylinder, pressure gradient and inversely proportional to viscosity. We know this, more the viscosity, lower is the maximum peak. Because more is the dampening, higher the signals that shout that don't go, don't go, don't go, more you will adjust, lower the velocity. Higher the suction, higher the velocity, more I kick you, you will keep going. More the radius, more chance of expansion, more sheets, right? More crowd, signals become weak, so more velocity. See how it is analogical? very very important analogy I explained to you about role of viscosity as communication signals between the fluid sheets. Now you can very easily find out the Q. Volume flow rate if you integrate you will simply get pi by 2 mu. You have to integrate in polar coordinates dp by dz r raised to 4 upon 4. Okay, So it is nothing complicated, it is simple and tau rz, the shear stress would simply be r by 2 dp by dz. I am not going to derive this because it is simple substitution of this velocity. For uz in tau you have to use del by del r, right? And moment you use del by del r, this becomes r by 2. So I don't have to do this. Q you have to integrate with r theta, so you can very well satisfy yourself by doing it. So see how Poiseuille's axisymmetric flow helped us a lot in deriving this parabolic profile and a mass flow rate. Now the analogy which was extended is to use a fifth and most important part is velocity profiles for cylinders which are rotating. Right? So you have this cylinders which are rotating. Radius of R1 and R2. Right? So you have literally formed this cylinder, right? Outside which there is one more cylinder, and these two cylinders are rotating, and there is a fluid between. Typical drums, rollers, all of them apply this. Now here, U R is equal to zero. Again, 
go envelope can cross uz this velocity has to be zero because there is no force pressure gradient right del p by del z is equal to zero there is no pressure in z it is only the rotational motion of the cylinders that is going to cause the flow now flow cannot u theta is not zero because if you rotate these two cylinders right you are going to experience a relative motion no roll between the drums that would mean that your theta profiles may look something like this right something like this because of the rotation so that is the case u z and u r have to be zero these two are very very simple continuity equations if that is the case r momentum equation would give you u dot del u r minus u theta square upon r this is zero is minus one upon rho dp by dr plus mu upon rho into del square u r this is zero minus u r upon r square this is zero minus two upon r square del u theta by del theta but this is also zero okay so the whole outcome you will be left with is simple conservation of forces a small element trapped between these two cylinders is going to experience a centrifugal force because of its u theta motion and a pressure force because of pressure gradient for an equilibrium from physics this has to match rho unit volume is mass m v square upon r is force per unit volume that's why this so simply u theta square is 1 upon rho del p by del r see how i have used standard force equation from which we have anyway derived our momentum equation from theta momentum equation you would have del by del r of u theta upon r plus del by del r of u theta is equal to 0 right this means u theta is function like ar plus b upon r if it is function of ar plus b upon r you can always substitute boundary conditions now there are two cases in this case 1 is free vortex and case 2 is bound vortex what is mean by free vortex free vortex simply means that your condition is omega 2 tending to 0 so you have these two balls and this rotational velocity tends to 0 inside cylinder rotating spinning and outside cylinder stationary that would mean velocity at the outer edge r is 0 if you derive it you would get u theta is equal to 2 pi u1 r upon 2 pi r right which is tau circulation strength upon 2 pi r very clear because these two constants are derived from this boundary conditions free vortex would simply mean you have a circulation tau of free vortex this inside cylinder spinning in your analogy of potential flow is nothing but vortex of strength tau right so it is tau upon 2 pi r pure potential free vortex field second condition is more interesting second condition is bound vortex or a force vortex here inside cylinder is zero as r tends to zero then you would have u theta is equal to omega 2 r pure rotational velocities where u theta is proportional to r 
it keeps on increasing as r increases these are the two conditions which poiseuille derived for rotating cylinder and this brings to the end of the chapter for this where we are going to solve one question two concentric cylinders of infinite length we saw that so z is in irresponsible radius 2 meter and 5 meter incompressible fluid is filled calculate the fully developed velocity profile when rotational due to shear forces is produced tangential velocities of inner and outer velocities are u1 equal to 0 u2 equal to 5 this is case 1 given u2 equal to 2 u1 equal to 2 u2 equal to 5 this is second condition given. what does a mean a means inside cylinder is stationary outside is rotating right so omega 1 is u1 upon r1 which is 0 right and omega 2 which is u2 upon r2 which is 5 by 5 which is 1 rad per second our u theta expression as we looked at by substituting the condition was radius ratio to relative velocity ratio if we substitute omega 1 is equal to 0 here it is simply omega 2 upon this so 1.19 r minus 4 upon this is the solution to first question in second question omega 1 is 1 and omega 2 is also 1 right because r1 is 2 r2 is 5 which means both cylinders are rotating at constant velocity in that case what would i get u theta as 1.38 r minus 6.89 upon r see i have simply substituted these terms okay a minus b upon r nothing else i have done the whole outcome of this is when inside cylinder is stationary and outside is rotating you would expect outside cylinder to superimpose its velocity on its own and inside cylinder to give you zero condition still the velocity is a this profile hmm? in outside you would see this profile so something like this has changed to this and both are rotating at single angle so this concludes our chapter on viscous effects of two dimensional cartesian frames axisymmetric flows infinite length cylinder poiseuille flows and effect of viscosity the main takeaway is always to remember the viscosity analogy i have taught you and how it is important now we have closed this chapter and we are ready to go to next chapter on boundary layers